All right, and we are recording. Yay. Okay, so um, I was saying we had, if you just mute, if you have any questions during this, either ask them at the end or raise your hand during the middle and stuff. Um, just indicate that you have a question or you can type it out in the chat. I'll keep an eye on the chat and we can, we'll, we'll get them all answered. You know, I want you to have answers, not continuing questions. So uh, let me go ahead and get my screen share pulled up here. Give me just one moment. I want to share this one. And it's thinking about it. Come on. Do what I told you to do. There you go. All right. So this is going to be about the tree of life from the neophyte perspective. Now, let me start off by saying a couple of things about this. First off, there are a lot of different ways that you could approach and understand the tree of life. If you took uh, 10 people that practice Kabbalah and you asked them to explain the tree of life, you would get 10 different answers. Or you might get 40, or you might get 400. And in a later lesson, you'll understand that the 40 and 400 are not arbitrary numbers. There's a reason for those. But for now, we're not going to go that de deep into it. We'll get there eventually. Um, this is kind of the way that I understand and approach the tree. Your viewpoint may be different, and that's okay, because it's all a unique experience that we have as we're going through and discovering these things for ourselves. And because we're, e we're all different, each of us is going to have a slightly different viewpoint on stuff. The other thing I'm going to mention is that there are a few things that I put in here that are not covered at the neophyte level. They're covered at a little higher level. There's just a, a couple of small things on here. Um, but I did that because it's important, I think, to understanding the tree. So um, if we get to those, um, I'm going to take time and explain everything so it won't be that weird for you. So y everything in here, you should be able to understand. Um, even though it may not be on your grade level at this point. So the tree of life, we're going to start off with nothing. Um, so in the beginning, there was God. And even that term God is not a good term for what it was that was there. Um, because really we can't understand what was there. It is something so beyond our understanding that we can't grasp our minds around it. We can't, we can't comprehend it. Um, now, the ancient Kabbalists, ancient Hebrews, had a really great way of dealing with this fact that you can't understand it. Rather than sit around and drive themselves crazy, thinking of trying to figure out what it is when, when it's something that we can't possibly understand, they just called it nothing or no thing, no thing we can understand. Uh, the Hebrew word is ein. Uh, sometimes you'll see it spelled A-Y-N, A-I-N. It's the same thing. Uh, so literally it means no thing uh, no thing that we can understand or get our mind around the divine if you want to use that term for it God the universe whatever you want to call it sometimes I call it Fred um, is just nothing that we can understand there are a few things that we can say about it the first thing that we can say is that it was everything that could exist, that has the possibility to exist. Everything there is, was, and ever will be is this entity, this being. 
and it's everything. It's without limits. It's everywhere. There's nothing that exists outside of it. This in this all encompassness, it's all every this everything that exists, they called and self, which is limitless or no limit. It's limitless. It's everything. So you can't say, you can't really use a term to define the divine. Because anytime you use the term to divide, define something, it states that this is what it is and this is not what it is. But since it's everything, you can't really define it as something. Any definition we put on it from our perspective is going to be limiting in some way. So we just understand it as being limitless. And as far as the nature of this being, we say it's divine light. It's and so far. And which is the limitless light. Um, now, I want to pause for a second right there. I'm going to come out of the screen share for just a second. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of physics here. So, light. And when we talk about light, we talk about what is light. So, light is and energy from our perspective. And, and of course, this is from our perspective here in the physical world. It's an energy, it's made up of particles called photons. Photons are kind of unique because they have a structure of a particle, but they also act as a wave of energy. So they're both a particle and a wave. Now, I'm going to shift gear, set that aside for just a second, and we're going to talk about physical world. What is the physical world? It's physical things. It's solids, liquids, gases, all this kind of stuff, all made up of atoms. Everything that's in the physical world is made up of atoms. These atoms are made up of subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, which are in turn made up of even smaller particles and even smaller particles. Until you get down to the smallest subatomic particles, which are really nothing more than an electrical charge that fluctuates at a given rate between a positive and negative charge. And that's what determines the qualities of the particles, which in turn determines the qualities of the atoms, which in turn makes my mouse a solid thing and I can't reach through it or anything like that. Um, all of that's determined by the rate of fluctuation. And we measure that rate of fluctuation in how many times it changes between the positive and the negative charge. Um, in radio, because y'all know I'm a ham radio nerd, uh, we call this hertz, how many times the it fluctuates through. And this is gonna be a really important thing, so pay attention to this part. The frequency is important. When you turn on your radio in your car, you turn it on and you tune to a certain station. I'm in Washington, D.C. I tune to 100.3, which has the best classic rock in the in the city. Yes. Um, but you tune to a certain station and certain information is carried along that carrier frequency, which vibrates at that particular hertz or megahertz or gigahertz or whatever it is at that particular frequency. So as you turn into that particular frequency, you're getting that particular station on your radio. As the energy, as you look at different frequencies of energy, you're going to get different messages along with it. You're going to tune into a different station. That's a really important concept for magic as we do it in the Golden Dawn. Because you're tuning in to the proper things. 
And that's why it's so important that you do all the work that goes along with everything and the understanding and the meditations and the rituals and stuff. You're the radio. You're tuning into the right frequencies. And if you don't get tuned into the right frequencies, you aren't going to get the right signals and the right things aren't going to happen. Now, what are these frequencies? Well, they're energy. They're vibrations. They're that wave of energy. They're also particles because that wave has to travel through something. So it's a wave and a particle, which was the exact same description, picking it up from before that we gave for light. So we say that in occult sciences, that everything that exists, the mouse, the table here, you, me, the air, everything is light. It's light energy that's whose vibe and that in light energy's vibration has slowed down to a point to where it, be, it manifests as a physical object or physical reality. Now that's going to be important as we go through the description of the tree. It's going to make a lot more sense to you as we go through this. So now I'm going to hop back to the PowerPoint. So give me just a second here. Share screen again. Okay. So we're here. We've said that God, and I'm going to use that term just for sake of ease and everything, uh, is nothing that we can understand. It's limitless. It encompasses everything. And it is this limitless light. Now, for some reason, and we don't know for sure what, because we can't really understand God or the concepts of God or what was going through God's mind, if you can even call it that. But for some reason, this divine everything decides to create. We have a lot of different um, what we suppose as reasons for this being happening. And one of the most popular ones, and the one that you usually hear most often, is God wanted to understand its own nature. It wanted to look upon itself. Um, but it couldn't because it was everything. It can't see itself. Uh, there's a Hebrew term that I don't remember the Hebrew pronunciation of, but it basically comes down to face cannot behold face. God could not see itself. It needed a mirror. So it decided to create one. So what happens is God creates within itself a void. It contracts out of a place within itself in an action called zimzum, which literally means contraction. And it creates a void, an empty spot within itself. And this is important because you got to understand this is within God. So God is all around it, all surrounding it. And it, it, this void is within it. And into this void, God projects a ray of light. And when it strikes the void, it creates a point of light. One singular point of divine brilliance. Now, we call this Kether. And Kether is the crown, as we you know, and if you've, I'm sure you've read your manuals, you better have, you're, you'll know that Kether is the top spear on the tree of life. And Kether translates as crown. So this is the first light of the divine. At this point, there's no real difference, at least not that we can discern, between Kether and the big divine being. It's basically the same thing. Um, there's no real separation between it. 
several times, if you look at some of the more modern schools of traditional Jewish Kabbalah, uh, they literally say that Kether and and so far are the same thing. It's the same entity. There's no distinction between them. Um, because it's the exact same thing, it has all of the potential. Everything that can exist, could exist, will exist, has existed, all of that potential is contained in Kether. But none of it is manifest yet. Now, the divine keeps sending in that ray of light. And the light starts to overflow from Kether. And it flows out. And creates a second point. That second point we call Hakoma. Or wisdom. And what this does. Is it creates two points. Now you have a separation. And this is the first expression of polarity of two different things. You have Kether, and then you have that which is not Kether, but it's still connected to it, so part of Kether. Um, this is the expression of energy flowing out and expanding. And this is what we call the masculine energy. And, or fire energy. Now, I want to take a moment and I want you to take the concept of femininity and masculinity as we look at it in culture and throw it completely out the window. Because that is something from our perspective here. That is not from the divine perspective. So you have to understand that when we're saying that fire or masculine energies have this quality or feminine energies have this quality. We're not saying that men or women have these qualities because everybody has this all in them. It's just a way of talking about how this energy works. And the masculine energy is an expanding energy. It projects out in whatever way, shape, form, or fashion. Now, Akoma sits at the top of the pillar of mercy. It's the, like I said, the masculine energy and the masculine expression of Kether, and we call it the supernal father or Abba. Uh, the energy continues to flow and then flows out of Akoma and to another sphere, and to another point, we call Bina, which is understanding. And this is the feminine counterpart of Hakoma, the supernal mother, Aima. So where Hakoma has activity, and it's all this energy, but it's just that energy. It's not directed yet. It's not focused into something yet. It's just energy and activity. Bina, as the supernal mother, is the form that it takes. It takes all that energy from Kether and it gives it a form. Until the energy has Kether, it's just potential energy. Or until, uh, not Kether, I'm sorry, Hakoma. It takes all that energy from Hakoma and it gives it form. Until you, that energy in Hakoma is given form by Bina, it doesn't produce anything. It's just potential energy. Um, we say that Bina is understanding. So at Hakoma, you have duality. You have two things. At Bina, you have understanding of that duality. You understand that I'm me and you're you and we're not the same thing. You, we may not understand what we are yet, but we know that there's a sense of individuality. 
Now, it's important to understand that these are the supernal things, uh, the supernal triangle. And these work purely on a causal level of events. These are purely the divine cause that starts everything from happening. Um, and it really, for us, that lives in just abstract ideas only. And you can see that I added a line in there for the triangle. Uh, the natural uh, or the directed flow of energy as it's coming out goes down from to Hakoma and then Bina. But this other path comes in because as energy flows, it will flow out to the spheres by itself. But the way it's evolving is going to be a particular pattern. And you'll see this go unfold as we go. So this energy flows into Bina and Bina gives it form. And that form that it takes is called Hased or mercy. Uh, it's the combination of the masculine and the feminine. Now, it's form. It's, it's giving form. If you think about um, geometry, you've got four points here, which is what you need to create a three-dimensional space. You've got to have four points. You know, three points creates a plane. Two points creates a line. You have to have four points to create width, depth, and height. So this is giving, this is creating form. Um, we say that Hesed is feminine. Now it's on the masculine side of the tree. It's on that pillar of mercy, but it's the form of the feminine energy. You could think of Hesed as the benevolent king who bestows gifts and benefits on his subjects. Um, it's really, uh, been a, or, uh, has said really relates to the accumulation of good deeds and love of a fraternal nature. It's, um, it gathers up all the unmanifest energies of the supernal triad and it, it is the form. So it's creating all of these forms. Um, like I said, it's the combination of the masculine and feminine. Because it has form, though, it's considered feminine. So it's the form aspect relate, um, reflected on the masculine side of the tree of life. As this energy continues to flow from Hakoma or from Hesed, it creates another sphere, which is Gavora. And Gavora can be severity, it can be strength. Um, it breaks down the forms created by Hesed. And this is very important because they balance one another out. Um, It, you have to have that perfect balance between the two. If you have, if one side is more, if it's too much form, too much uh, has said, then you're you have an overabundance of mercy. If it's too much Gabora, you have an overabundance of severity. Now, if we think of has said as the benevolent king, uh, Gabora is masculine it's fiery but it's on the feminine side of the tree and you think about this as the fiery nature of the mother who is protecting her children that energy that you're going to do whatever it takes to protect your offspring um so it's fire and essentially masculine, but it's a feminine expression of that. 
Um, it aggressively deals with anything that corrupts the energies of Kether. It, any forms that are created that don't support that energy of Kether or that don't, um, or that take away from that energy, it deals with and it breaks down. And then what these do, because they balance each other out, is they create a balanced point between them, which is Tifereth, beauty. And this strikes the perfect balance between Hesed and Geburah, uh, between those benevolent energies and those aggressive energies. And we say that Tifereth is the mediator between the two sides of the tree of life, and it's the balance point between them. But it's also the mediator between the upper half of the tree and the lower half of the tree. Um, between that higher state of being and that lower state of being. Above Tipereth, all of this is abstract. Tipereth is really the first point where we can really have a more conscious understanding and real awareness of what's happening. Um, we call Tipereth the reconciler or the redeemer. So you'll have the Christ consciousness or the Christ figures or Osiris or whatever redeeming God you have is typically exemplified by Kether or by Tipereth, I'm sorry. And this forms a second triangle. I thought I had one of just the triangles in there. Okay, um, so the energy is flowing down, continues to flow down through all of the spheres. And all the spheres are kind of interconnected. And as we do this, you'll see the patterns start to form for the tree. I knew I had one of the triangles. There it is. So this creates a second triangle which is the mirror reflection of the first triangle. So, Bina was reflected in Hesed. Ha um, Hakoma was reflected in Gabora, And Kether is reflected in Tipereth. And we call this the ethical triangle. And this is the triangle where you have discrimination between the creators and the created. And where ideas, which come from the abstract in the supernal triangle, start to take form in the ethical triangle. Um, it's changing, it's starting to change from abstract ideas to realized matter, but it's not there yet. But the actual process of manifestation is where we, that we can conceive of where things start to take form starts in Kether, it starts in this, or, or starts in Tipereth, it starts in this ethical triangle. So from here, energies keep flowing from Tipereth down to Netzach, which is victory. Let me grab a drink real quick. And this is the dwelling place of the human instincts, emotions, and desires. Uh, the animal, the raw animal instincts are here. So this is back, getting back to fire. This is bringing fire back to the other side of the tree. This is a reflection of um, Gabora mediated by Tipereth coming down into Netzach. And this is the feeling side of the personality. This is where the personality is starting to form. This is your feelings, your creativity, the dynamic force that drives us, our emotions. All of those dynamic forces are reflected through from Gabora through Tipereth into Netzach. So we say that it's fire again on this side of the tree. Um, 
just like above and just like all of the triangles before it, that has to be balanced. And it's balanced by Hoag or Splendor, which is the intellectual part of the mind. And it organizes and categorizes. It's responsible for communication, um, language, science, and magic. Um, the intellect is needed to balance the emotions. It stabilizes and disciplines the emotions. Um, and it's the individual mind as opposed to the individual emotions. And these two have to balance each other because without emotions, the mind becomes rational and basically dead and uninspired. But without the mind, the intellect or the emotions just run wild out of control and just burn up the personality um it is the energies of water from um has said reflected through tippereth down into the personality of the individual And because these two balance each other out, it creates another point, which is Yesud, which we call the foundation. And this is the union of Netzach and Hod. This is the astral matrix upon which the entire material universe is built. Um, it receives all the previous energies from above, and it puts them into the framework which the universe will be built on. Um, everything that exists, exists in Yesud before it is manifest in reality. Uh, Yesud is androgynous and balanced between the masculine and the feminine energies. And it's the reflection of Tipperath. Because as you'll see, of course, the energy continues to flow down, filling in the pathways, uh, creating the tree, creating the patterns through which all of these energies flow. And the third triangle, which is the astral triangle, forms the individuality and the personality of a person in the tree. And gives that framework which we're built on. And as you see, it's a reflection of the ethical triangle. Now this continues on. The energy continues to flow through because it hasn't reached manifestation yet. It hasn't reached completion yet. And that completion is found in Malkuth. Which is, which is the kingdom. The ultimate sphere of form. This is manifest creation. This is the world as we know it. Uh, the physical manifestation with all its four elements. Um, and it's the completion of the tree. It's the reflection of Kether on the material world. And it's it's sometimes called the bride, the bride of Kether. And it is that expression of the divine that when the divine started to send that light into Kether, this uh, Malkuth is the mirror reflection of the divine so that divine can observe it. Now, of course, the energies are all flowing down to the to Kether here from above, or from to Malkuth here from above. And the energies not only pour, pour in from Yesu, but they pour in from Hod and from Netzach as well, which gives Malkuth the four colors that you see there, uh, which are the four expressions of the elements earth, air, fire, and water. On the physical world. 
um, creating the tree, creating all manifest energies so that the divine ain ain't so ain't so far can observe itself and can become aware of itself and learn itself and it's in this physical world that exists manifest all of the possibilities that are up here in kether everything that exists is a manifest expression of that in one form or another And incidentally, this is where a lot of like Christian churches and stuff go wrong because they say God is love and, you know, evil stuff is not of God. All of that potential exists in the divine, good and evil. It's all there and the divine is learning from it as we as it is experienced and it's learning from each of us as we go through it. And as we make our choices of what to do, whether that be good or evil, hopefully it's not evil, the divine learns through us and through everything that exists. Now, if you've looked at the Tree of Life in your study manual and you look at my diagram here, You'll notice that there's an extra line on it, the extra line that goes from Binod to Hesed. Um, that's there because there are actually two patterns that are associated with it. Uh, the first pattern is called the Path of the Flaming Sword, or sometimes called the Path of the Lightning Strike. And this is the path that the energy coming from the divine takes according to the divine will in the process of manifestation. So this is the process that, or the pattern in which all of the spheres were um, created. This is a path of that divine will and that divine energy coming down from Kether down to Malkuth and the pattern that it takes. The other pattern, which you'll call the, which we call the tree of life, in my opinion, is more of a passive pattern in the sense that where the, the flaming sword is directed by divine will. This is just the natural energies flowing by themselves. And so they flow to different spheres in different orders. Now, there's a reason that there's not a path directly from Bina to Hesed. And later on, when you get into, I want to say, philosophers, um, practicus or philosophers, one of the two, but I think it's philosophers, where we start talking about different aspects of the tree and stuff, then you'll get that. And there's a reason why it's not there. But um, for now, just understand that this is the pattern that the energies flow through. And this is the pattern that we use as magicians to move back up the tree. Um, I know of a few schools that try to say you start at the top of the tree and you move down the tree. But that doesn't work if we're down here at the bottom at Kether or, or at Malkuth. We can't start off at Kether. So we start off at Malkuth and we work our way back up the tree, reuniting our consciousness with the divine and bringing the lower personality, the lower manifestation, the lower ego in alignment with those higher energies and that higher will. So, like I said, this is a really um, 
basic view of the tree of life. There are many, 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 many different ways you can look at things. You can think about things, um, different understandings you can take from it, and you'll be exposed to a lot of those. Believe me, it only gets more confusing from here. So, um, and and then it will become clear, and then it will get confusing again, and then it will become clear. Um, be prepared for that. Um, so hopefully that gives you a better understanding of the tree of life and why we work with it and how we work with it and the significance of it and the spheres through um, our perspective. So now questions. How does the Adam Catamon um, work into this framework? Good question. Adam Catamon, there are a couple of different ways of looking at Adam Catamon. The way I usually look at Adam Catamon is Adam Catamon is an archetypal energy, an archetypal expression. Adam Kedmon exists in and so far. Um, but we go back here. The diagram, uh, the image of Adam Kedmon is the reflection of the tree of life in and so far. Okay, I see. So but we'll talk more about Adam Kedmon again. I think that's philosophus or practicus, one of the two. Okay. Um, that's uh, philosophus. philosophus. Hey, it's been so long since I went through them. I don't know where it's at. It's in there somewhere. It's up higher than where we're at right now. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Nothing. So you have complete understanding now of everything. I think so. <laughs> Hope so. Are you going to talk about the four worlds, Frater? Um, yes. Uh, the, the four worlds are discussed at uh, Zelator. So yeah, we'll go through all four of the worlds. So we'll have another one of these, which will, if you think this was bad, just wait till you go through that because it gets mm -hmm. worse. I thought this was an excellent uh, example of what manifestation is, because I was kind of curious on how this actually worked, you know, tethered to Malkuth. So the divine, Fred, wished to know itself, but it couldn't know itself because it was everything. So it created a mirror, Malkuth, of which it could know itself. And the four colors on Malkuth are a reflection of the four elements manifested on Earth. Elements. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That pretty much sums it up for me. Cool. Let me go ahead and I'll stop sharing here. All righty then. Uh, actually, let me go ahead and I'll go ahead and end the video here, video recording, and then we'll see if there's anything else. So. Okay.